bipartite networks. Uh, these are really useful and um, have a lot of beautiful theory as well attached to them. So uh, we talked about bipartite networks before. Uh, it looks like this. It's a network where you have uh, some nodes on the left and some nodes on the right. And uh, all of the edges uh, connect things on the left to things on the right. Um, left and right, blue and red, black and white, up and down, whatever you like. The point is just that every edge connects uh, a thing in, in one kind of class to a thing uh, in another kind of class. Okay, so the, the important aspect here is that there aren't any edges going from, for example, A to C, right? There's no, there's no blue to blue edges and no red to red edges. A matching is uh, just a set of edges where no two edges share a vertex. Okay, it's called a matching for kind of an, an obvious reason, right? You're, you're matching things on the left up with things on the right here. So we have, uh, we've taken this bipartite network and I've, I've emphasized here a few of these edges and these three edges we would say form a, a matching because every, um, um, every vertex has at most one um, edge that's you know being matched right there's there's never there's never a vertex that has like two edges that are coming out of it like that that wouldn't be allowed so it's called a matching intuitively because well you're you're sort of pairing you're pairing things up and you're not necessarily pairing everything up we, we have a name for that which you'll see in just a minute but you're pairing some things up now I have a note here as well this is also a perfectly valid concept for a network that is not uh, bipartite Okay, there's no reason you can't have that. You, you could have any old arbitrary network and say, uh, you know, this this would be a matching, uh, and we'll put a few other that are not matched too. Um, right, this would be a this would be any old network that is. Uh, let's see, let's 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 put some unmatched edges here just so we can confirm that this is indeed not bipartite. It's got a triangle in it, so we know off the bat that's not going to be um, a bipartite network. Okay, so this would be this would be a matching. Um, these edges here would form a matching in a in a non-bipartite network. So we, we probably won't, um, actually we will talk a little bit about non-bipartite matchings later, but um, the best way to get into this topic is to look at the bipartite case. Now, the special case when you match up everything, uh, if you touch every vertex, so you choose edges so that um, each edge or each vertex touches exactly one edge like you see here, so everything on the left is paired up with everything on the right, uh, that's called perfect. That's called a perfect matching. Um, and as a sanity check here, of course, you'd have to have the same number of um, vertices on the left as on the right. I'm going to say U, the blue vertices, is going to be the, the one set, and then W, the red, will be the other. That'll be my convention going forward. Uh, a lot of applications of this. This is a really, really useful, um, a useful data structure. It comes up a lot. Um, medical students to hospital appointments. Um, Al Roth won a Nobel Prize in 2012 for uh, some research that he did on this, where you would you would take um, a bipartite matching of of pairing up newly graduated medical students with hospitals that were trying to hire new doctors, and to figure out the the optimal way to pair them up. Um, that was that was. Uh, very celebrated example. Um, in general, when you have workers and, and tasks, uh, and that occurs in all kinds of concept, contexts, um, you can imagine that's a useful thing, right? Assigning people to do stuff. Uh, everyone needs to do that. Uh, and then more generally, supply and demand, right? Using these kinds of structures to model uh, markets uh, is something that, that happens all the time. Um, using this kind of structure to, to pair up buyers and sellers, there's a whole lot of work done on that. Uh, David Gale, um, wrote a very famous uh, sort of monograph uh, on this topic as well, as well, and we'll look into a little bit of that um, very shortly. So let's first just ask about perfect matchings. Um, let's ask when you can find a perfect matching, right? How do we know one exists? Uh, let's try and find necessary uh, or sufficient conditions for the answer, you know, for the question of uh, does a perfect matching exist in this network or not? So we could look at this one here and we could ask, hey, is there a, is there a perfect matching in this network? And you could look at this and, and you, could, you could say, nope, I know for sure that there is not a perfect matching in this network. And I could do that by saying, the reason I know that 
is because these three vertices here, V, W, and X, they are special. Um, they form what is called a constricted set. Okay, and what do I mean by that? I mean that I've got, if I look at these three vertices here, and I look at all of the edges that are coming out of these three vertices, uh, where do they go? Well, they all only go into these two vertices here, right? Just look at where all these, all these edges are going. They're just going into these two. So I can look at this and I can say, I know that there isn't a perfect matching because for this special set here, for this set of three vertices here, um, I've got three vertices that are, you know, in, on the aggregate in, in, in total, uh, connected to only two vertices like that. And I'd say, well, because of that, I know there's no way I could pair these three vertices up, period. So I can look at this and put my pencil down and say, nope, there's no perfect matching here. There's also another constricted set down here that's actually easier to see, um, three blue nodes that are um, collectively connected to only um, these two reds. Okay, so for this example here, we can say, I, I know that there isn't a perfect matching because of this. And, you know, maybe I got, I got lucky in that case, or whatever you want to call it, that there happened uh, to be this sort of obvious, uh, obvious uh, phenomenon here. Okay, let's introduce some notation. Um, if I have S is a subset of vertices, in this case, the, the red things here, uh, we're going to define something called the neighbor set, N of S. And that just means the set of all the neighbors of elements of S. So N of S just means all of the vertices that are somehow connected to something in S. And, uh, and I said this set is constricted, meaning that, uh, you know, the neighbor set of S had cardinality 2, uh, and the set S itself had cardinality 3. And um, so because of that, we'd say, well, this is a constricted set, and therefore um, there's no matching. Okay, so just I just want to define this notation here of a, a neighbor set because that's going to come up all the time in this, uh, in this course. So we established a necessary condition for the existence of a perfect matching, right? I said, if you can find this set um, that is constricted, where the, the cardinality of the set is greater than that of its neighbors, um, if you can find such a set, well, then you, you can conclude that there isn't a perfect matching, so that's fine. Um, and so it's natural to say that's, that's a, a necessary condition for, um, for the existence of a perfect matching. And, and you could say, well, what about the converse, right? Let's say, uh, let, let's say, can we get, turn this into a sufficient condition somehow? So let's suppose that this is never true. Okay, let's suppose that I, I get a, a bipartite network and I... I look, I look for a constricted set, and I say, okay, let's try and find a constricted set, because if I found one, I'd know there's no perfect matching. And I say, well, okay, if I can't find one, um, then, you know, is it the case uh, that a perfect matching exists? Let's say that that's true. Okay, let's suppose that there isn't a perfect matching. So if every time I grab a set of vertices of, on one side, um, that the neighbor set is larger than that, than that set. Okay, so if I cannot find a constricted set, um, does it mean that there is a perfect matching? Feels like the answer is no, but actually this is somewhat surprisingly true. Um, a perfect matching exists if and only if there is no constricted set. Um, so let's prove that statement. Uh, so the way we will prove it, um, we're going to do a lot of monkeying with logic. Um, in terms of the statement that we're actually going to end up proving. This is the, this is the easiest, simplest way I know to, to go about this. Actually, that's a lie. Um, there's a much easier way to do this using linear programming um, duality theory, and we'll look at that later. Um, but this is the easiest way that doesn't involve any um, higher level machinery. So what do we know? We, already, we, all, we can all agree that if there is a constricted set, then there isn't a perfect matching. We, we're fine with that. Um, and so we want to prove um, if there isn't a constricting set, then there is a prefer perfect matching, um, which equivalently uh, will we'll prove the, um, I think it's the, the contrapositive or the, the converse or something, um, which is, will prove the following. If a perfect matching does not exist, then there exists a constricting set. Okay, so that's the way we're going to go about this. We're going to take a network and we're going to say, assume that there isn't a perfect matching here. And then we're going to find a constricting set. Uh, and that will suffice to prove this claim. So that's, that's how we're going to go about it. All right, so let's start with um, 
uh, a network and we'll say there isn't a perfect matching. I've drawn I've drawn a bipartite network with a, a very visually nice matching here, right? They're all um, everything is just paired up to its uh, the thing on its uh, you know aligned with it horizontally. Um, and let's assume that in this network there isn't a perfect matching. So you'll see here I've got these vertices here that are that are unmatched. Okay, so this is a, we'll say, okay, you've got a maximum matching M. So it's a matching that's as big as possible. So you're pairing up as many edges as you can, um, but uh, it is not perfect. So some there remain vertices that are uh, unma unmatched. And, and this vertex here, if you can't read the black on blue font, this is called U. This is vertex U. U is unmatched. And so what we are going to do, is we're going to look at every path there is in this network that consists of the following. And you can kind of see, I've, I've traced out one example of such a path here in this uh, in gray here. We're going to take paths that do this. We're going to start, we're always going to start at U because U is our special unmatched uh, vertex. And we're going to go from U, we're going to move along an edge that isn't matched, like this one here. And then we'll go on an edge that is matched and then an edge that is not matched, and an edge that is matched, and an edge that is not, and a match that uh, an edge that is matched, like this. That is called an alternating path. Okay, we're going to look at all of the alternating paths in this network that start at U. So I'll say that again. We are going to look at the set. We're going to call it P of every path in this bipartite network that does the following. It's every path that starts at U. And then it moves along an edge that is not in the matching. Now, of course, that's any edge because by assumption, U is, is not in the matching. U is not matched to anything. So you have mu, you go along an edge that, that isn't in the matching. And then you go along an edge that is in the matching. And then you alternate. So not in the matching, in the matching, not in the matching, in the matching. That is one example of an alternating path. Presumably, there would be a lot of others here, but I haven't drawn them because the, the visual would get in the way. So. Um, that's what we're looking at here. These are called alternating paths. We're going to look at, at all of those, and that is going to be called P. Um, so here's the claim. The claim is that if a vertex other than U, if a vertex is in P, then so is its uh, partner in the matching. So what does it mean if I say a vertex is in P? If a vertex is in P, it means that there's some way of getting there alternating with the, with uh, edges that are matched and edges that are that are unmatched. So you know, according to this. Um, you know, the, all of these vertices here obviously would, would be in P, okay, all of these things here. Um, and so, so uh, the claim is that um, if you are in P, if you're reachable by an alternating path, then so is your partner. So one of these is easy. Um, one of these is easy, and that is, excuse me, there. Uh, one of these is easy, and one of these is that, uh, well, if you land on a blue vertex, let's just draw this picture again. Here's me moving along an alternating path. I go here, 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 and here. Let's ask, anytime you land on a blue vertex, you had to have come from a, an edge in the matching, right? Because of the nature in which you alternate. Anytime I land on a blue vertex, and I'll just erase this, you can verify that here of this path. Anytime I'm landing on a blue vertex, um, I'm always... I only could have done that if I if I entered it from an edge in the matching, and so what does that mean? Any if, if that's the case, then any for any blue vertex, uh, the red uh, partner in the matching has to has to be accessible as well, has to be in P. So we know the statement holds for blue vertices. Now I claim it also holds for red vertices, and why is that? Um, anytime I land on a red vertex, I must have come from an edge that isn't in the matching. Right, just look at the alternating path again. I go, if I start at U, here's me landing on a vertex, a red vertex here. That edge was not in the matching, and then I, I alternate and I land here at this vertex, which is not in the matching, and I go here to here, and this uh, edge there is, is not in the matching. Right, anytime I'm landing on a red vertex, I came from an edge that isn't uh, in the matching. And so, so what? So I'm trying to prove, remember that, um, I'm trying to prove that uh, if a vertex is in P, then so is its matched partner. Alrighty, so let's ask, why, why does this have to be true? Well, let's suppose I didn't. Okay, let's suppose I had the following situation. Let's suppose I went from U and I alternated and I went uh, not in the matching, in the matching, not in the matching, in the matching, not in the matching. And I said, oh, wait a minute. Um, no, I'm stuck here. 
I'm stuck because now I'm at this red vertex, but it doesn't have a, a partner in the matching. And, uh, and so that would contradict that previous statement. Well, then you'd look at this path I came up with and, and you'd say the following. You'd go, well, you, um, you started at U. This is, this is now me taking the path and like laying it out horizontally, right? You started at U, you went to red, you went to blue, you went to red, you went to blue, you went to red, like that. Okay, and then you got stuck. There's nothing, there's no place you could go from there by, by assumption. Well, then you'd say, hey, wait a minute. Um, I can actually make my matching bigger because what I can do is I can erase these edges and I can replace it with these like I did down here. Okay, keep, keep everything else the same, but just sort of flip, um, flip the parity or whatever you want to call it of, um, of the matched versus the unmatched edges as I go from uh, as I go from, from one side to the other. Well, what would that mean? It means I found a way to make my matching bigger, right? Because there's two, there's two matched edges in this picture, but there are three over here. Um, and that is a contradiction because by assumption, I said my matching was maximal. I said, no, assume that M is the biggest possible matching you could get. And so I've established that if I were ever to go along an alternating path and land somewhere that's red, and be stuck there, um, then I'd say, oh, hey, look, if you've done that, then you've found a way also to improve the size of your matching. And, uh, and that can't be allowed because we, we assumed that the, uh, the matching M was maximal. So that's a contradiction, and uh, therefore um, the statement holds. Uh, the statement in particular is uh, that if a vertex other than U, which is this singled out vertex to here that is unmatched, uh, if a vertex is in P, which is to say, if it is accessible by the, an alternating path, then so is its matched partner from M. Okay, so we can establish that. And therefore, the vertices on the, uh, if you look at the, so the, the vertices belonging to P, uh, the blue vertices, the number of that has to be exactly one greater than the number of red vertices that are accessible this way. Okay, so why is that? Well, because you've got um, what this theorem here tells you is that all the vertices that are accessible, all the vertices in P, um, uh, any, it consists of nothing but, but matched pairs, right? Anything and then its partner there. So therefore the cardinalities are the same, except you've also got U here in the blue side, which is why you add in a plus one like that. All right, so um, in particular, um, the, the right-hand side of this thing is one greater than the, the left-hand side, which is how we're going to uh, find this constricted set, which was the goal of this um, proof anyway. Um, so now our claim is going to be that, in fact, the neighbors of the blue vertices in P, uh, if I look at all of the blue vertices in P, right, whatever they, whatever they might happen to be, I don't know. Um, if I look at all of them and I look at their neighbors, and I don't just mean neighbors with respect to the matching, I mean the neighbors with respect to all of these edges, uh, I claim that that neighbor set is actually equal to just the set of alternating paths, um, the P, the red vertices that can be touched by an alternating path. Um, and this is the final step needed to, to establish uh, a constricted set. Um, so why is that true? Well, it's, it's again the augmenting path argument, because if you had a vertex uh, W that was a neighbor of something lying in P, but it wasn't accessible directly from P, then you'd also be able to build this augmenting path again. Uh, if you're starting to get a little, uh, your eyes are starting to glaze over a bit, that's perfectly normal. All I really want to convey uh, in this argument is um, this notion of, of alternating paths and how hopefully you can kind of see how this is something important. Um, and now the proof is done because what do you have? You've got um, You've got the blue vertices in P uh, is one greater than the red vertices in P, and the neighbors of the blue vertices is exactly equal to the, the neighbor of the, of the blue vertices in P is exactly equal to the red uh, vertices in P, or the, the cardinality of that, and therefore the um, neighbor set is, in this case, one less than the um, size of the blue set. So you found a constricting set, there's no matching, and you're done. So that's uh, that's how you prove Hall's theorem. Now again, you're you're about to you're 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 going to see in a couple lectures a much simpler proof of this uh, involving linear programming, uh, complementary slackness, and duality. So, uh, in fact, that's how I always remember this proof myself. Um, here's a little distraction here. This is um, 
almost the magic trick, but it's a it's a pretty lousy one. Um, and it looks like this. So you you have a deck of 32 playing cards, sorry, 52 playing cards, and you deal these uh, playing cards into 13 piles of four cards each. And the the state the goal is to prove that it's always possible to choose exactly one card uh, from each pile to obtain a hand with each of the 13 values, uh, ace through king. Okay, so the the idea here is that you'd have, um, I'll try and draw this really quick. Uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, just barely. Um, these are piles of cards and each one of them has four cards in them. And the, what you want to prove is that there's some way of reaching into each of these piles, which has four cards, and um, removing one card from each of those. Uh, so maybe I pull uh, you know, an ace out of this one, and a two out of here, and a three out of here. That there's some way of doing this so that each, um, uh, taking one card out of each pile so that each possible value appears um, exactly once. So 10 and a jack there and a queen and a king. So you can use uh, Hall's matching theorem to prove this. All right, the, the key thing, the key construction here is um, what kind of bipartite network should you make? And, and I think it's probably, um, I think it's probably pretty intuitive what you should do. You could pause this if you want to try and think about it, um, but I'll work through the answers. So what you would do is you'd build a bipartite network with a vertex for each uh, pile. So you'll and in one side, so that'll be that'll be you on the left will be um, the the piles, piles like that. I hope you can read it. Uh, these are my piles here. It's like one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and then my uh, W. I think I'm calling it over here. <clears throat> w will be the uh, values. Uh, so this will be this first vertex will be an ace. This will be a two, a three, and a four, and so on and so forth, uh, up to a king here, like that. And uh, I'll do a queen and, and a jack like that. Okay. And now you can ask, well, what should I? You know, what is the obvious way to build this network? How should the connections go? Well, pretty clearly, you should connect uh, connect a pile to a value if. Um, if, it, if that value appears in that pile, right? So, so let's say pile one, uh, let's say that's a four and a four and then a, an ace and a uh, jack. So what does that mean you do? It means you take um, over you, here you, you do a, an edge here to the four and you just connect it once like that, even though there's, there's two fours, but we don't care about that. Four, four, and then an ace appears there as well. And then a jack appears there too. All right, so that's that's how you build a, a bipartite network, and you do that for all of these, right? You just build all kinds of edges every time uh, you know the, the value appears in the in the corresponding pile. Okay, so how does this uh, theorem work, or this this trick, so to speak, work? I think it's pretty clear that we're looking for a perfect matching here, right? We're we're exactly looking for a perfect matching in this network here. If, if we can if we can establish that a perfect matching exists, then that's how you pull these cards out. Um, so how do you prove that a perfect matching exists? Well, you'd, you'd prove that there's no constricted set. Uh, and so how would you do that? Well, let's think of it this way. So let's pick any set S in the, in the left, okay? S is gonna be some subset of vertices in the left. And so what does that mean? So we'll say, let's suppose the size of S is K. So S is K piles. And that means you have what? That means you have 4K cards in your hands, right? If I take three piles, I've got 12 cards. So um, k piles is four times k cards. So how many, um, how many values must appear? How many values uh, must appear in, uh, in these four cards uh, must appear? Well, so think about it. If I've got, if I've got 12 cards in my hand, um, how many different values do there have to be? There has to be at least uh, three values in them, right? Because uh, each card can appear up to four times. So how many values must appear at least? Okay. 
there have to be at least k different values that appear, right? There's no way for me to be holding 12 cards in my hand and there's only two different values present, right? Decks of cards don't work that way. So um, if I've got 12 cards in my hand, there have to be three different values that are visible and, uh, and so on and so forth. So if I've got k, um, four times k cards in my hand, uh, there have to be at least uh, k values and therefore uh, the size of s uh, has to be um, less than or equal to the size of the, the neighbors of s. That is the graph uh, theoretic statement of of this bit up here. So k uh, size of s is equal to k, and the uh, n on s there is um, uh, just the number of values that you'd have to have. So that's how you would that's how you would work that out. It's it's so kind of simple it almost feels like you you have to be missing something, but it's it's uh, pretty straightforward. Alrighty, so that's that. Oh, and there's the proof. Uh, let's talk about um, algorithms for this, right? How do I how do I actually find a maximum matching? Um, I've proven existence of one, but you know we'd actually like to find these things in practice. Um, and so, how would we do that? Um, it turns out that these augmenting uh, these alternating paths actually uh, play an important role in uh, in algorithms for for matchings as well. Um, and we're going to find an algorithm that's a little more general. Um, it's not just going to look for a perfect matching. Uh, we're just going to we're going to describe a, a constructive way to find the maximum matching in this network. And so this is a concept that even works if you don't have the same number of vertices in the two pieces, right? We're just going to say, give me a bipartite network and find the largest matching that exists uh, in this thing. Uh, and so in order to do that, we're going to define something called an augmenting path, which is just an alternating path that has that weird property we looked at a moment ago where the, it begins and ends at vertices that are, that are not matched. Uh, right, so it's it's a it's a path that looks like this, right, where you have um, a vertex here, and then you've got an unmatched edge like that, and then a vertex here, and then a matched edge, and a vertex there, and a unmatched like this, and we'll just do one more for no particular reason uh, there, and an unmatched, and we are done. Okay, so this would be an alternating, sorry, this would be called an augmenting path. It is also an alternating path because it alternates between matched and, and unmatched edges. Uh, it is augmenting uh, because it has this property that we had before where it begins, it, remember it begins at this vertex here and it ends over here, and it begins and ends, if you look at it, at vertices that are, that are not in the matching. And um, so this kind of, this is the path where if it exists, then you've, you've magically found a way to uh, increase the size of your matching by one, right? By, by filling in the unmatched edges and then erasing the, the ones that are, that are actually matched. Okay, so um, we've, uh, we know it's obvious that if M is a maximum matching, then there certainly isn't an augmenting path because if there's an augmenting path, you can make things bigger. So we, we can agree that, yeah, there's none of the, this doesn't exist. Um, and now let's, let's ask if uh, the implication goes the other way, okay? Which is to say, let's suppose I've got, um, suppose I've got a matching and it does not have an augmenting path. Um, now, how would I conclude that? Well, you, you'd try really hard or something. We'll, we'll get into that, um, but we won't worry about that for now. So we'll say, okay, you've got a matching, and uh, there is not an augmenting path. And so we're going to ask the question, does that mean that this is therefore the biggest matching you could have? Right? If there's no augmenting path, does it mean that, there, that this is the biggest you could, you could get? Um, again, it feels like the answer should be no. This feels, if you've done enough optimization, right? this feels like a statement about uh, a local minimizer, and, and it doesn't say anything about being global. Um, but yet, actually, once again, it, it actually is true. Uh, this is called Burge's theorem, and it says that a matching is maximum if and only if there's no augmenting path. Uh, and so how do you prove this? Um, it's it's kind of neat. You look at... Um, you look at two different matchings and and derive sort of a, a pigeonhole type argument from it. So let's draw a let's draw a matching here. We'll draw uh, M is going to be a, a thick line or M star rather is yeah M star is, is a maximum matching, and then M is just uh, I'll, uh, dotted lines for that. That's just um, some other matching. 
Um, and so what we're going to do now is we'll say, uh, assume that M, so M star will be maximum. And regular M is not maximum. So um, in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to say, if M is not a maximum matching, uh, then uh, we're going to construct an augmenting path. And we're going to construct this augmenting path using M star, uh, the, the true optimal solution. So this, is, this does not give me an algorithm for finding a maximum matching because it depends on knowing the answer to begin with. But it does tell me that, or it, it, I'm going to prove that if you have a matching that isn't maximum, uh, then there has to be a, an augmenting path. And, and we're going to obtain that from looking at the, the true optimizer. So or the true optimum. So let's draw a bipartite network here. Um, I always draw a really bad picture for this, so I hope I do a good job this time. Uh, I'll do six vertices, I think. Um, yeah, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. And same on the other side, and we'll do it like this. We'll say M, or M star rather, I'll do this, I'll do this. And I'll do uh, that one, and I'll say this next one goes down here like that, and then this last one goes like like this. Uh, so we'll say this is maximum and, and not perfect, and then that, that'll be that. And now the not maximum one will be this thing here. We'll say this edge, and, uh, and this edge looks good. This will be... M like that. Okay, so so M star has a, a five, four edges in it. It turns out, and uh, and regular old M has has three. Okay, and so what do we do? So I drew these two. I put these two matchings, and I superimposed them on each other. Okay, I, I drew these two edge, uh, matchings uh, on top of one another. And uh, in this example here, I, I I drew it so that they didn't have any edges in common. Um, and if they did, you just throw them away. Uh, so you, you just disregard those. Okay, so what are we left with? We know by construction, uh, because M star is maximum and M is not, that there have to be more edges from M, uh, M star, more edges from M star uh, than in M. And uh, so what is true about this picture here? Um, every edge, or every vertex rather, has a degree of at least two. Right, because what did I do? I took two matchings and I put them on top of each other. So therefore, every vertex um, has at most two edges coming out of it. Right? There's no way you could have a vertex with with, with three edges because you wouldn't. That wouldn't have come from two matchings. So what does that what does that mean? You could have. Um, it means that uh, Q, which is what I'm calling um, Q, is just the union of all of these edges here. Uh, it means what do I have? It means the only thing I can get. Um, I have a bunch of alternating paths. Okay, they have to be alternating because you, you put two matchings on top of one another. And, and what do I have from this? Well, I've got some loops, right? Some of these are cycles, and I can just ignore those. Um, some of these are cycles, but somewhere in there, there has to be a, a path that uh, begins and ends with a, um, an edge that is in M star. Okay, like this one right here. Um, and so what is that? Well, that is an augmenting path with respect to M. That is an augmenting path right here. Uh, augmenting path with respect to M is this thing up there. And that is how we, that is how that theorem works. So the natural follow-up to this question is, you know, okay, well, what is, what is the actual algorithm for this? Uh, oh, and my text is still loading in there. I'll give it a minute. Um, you could ask, so how do you actually, what is the algorithm for finding a maximum matching then? Uh, right, I've just, I've, that, that can, the, the procedure I just described isn't very useful because it, um, it depends on knowing the actual matching, right? So that doesn't work. And um, so here's, here's a way to make this a little bit algorithmic, although you, you don't have enough building blocks yet to, to um, to do something more concrete, but I, hopefully this will be enough to convince you. Um, so here's the question. You, you have a matching, and uh, you'd like to find, a ma find an augmenting path if it exists. Um, right, so, and, and that, then you'd have an algorithm for finding a maximum matching. 
uh, just start with any old matching and just keep finding augmenting paths until you can't anymore. Um, and so here's how you would do this, uh, or th at least this is a way of taking that problem and turning it into something that, that hopefully sounds somewhat concrete to you. So what you do um, is you take every, um, you take every edge, you take a matching, um, in fact, here, let me, let me draw this one too, because there's a lot going on in this picture. So let's say you have a bipartite network. This is five vertices here like this and, uh, and like that. And let's suppose for the moment what I have is I've just got two matched edges. I'm just copying over this picture here. I've got this edge here and I've got this edge here. And there, there's, you know, there's all sorts of other edges that are, that are in this thing. And in fact, I'll, I'll draw them here with, with dots like that. I'm just copying over this picture uh, on the slide. And I'll try and do this as quickly as I can, like that. That goes there, that one's there. Here, like that, like that. There's a lot of edges here that are, that are not being matched. Okay, that's just me copying that thing down. And so what you do is you say, okay, let's do the following. Let's put an orientation on these edges. Okay, let's put a direction on them, make a directed network. And I'm going to put a direction that goes right to left for the matched edges. And I'm going to put a direction that goes left to right for the others. Okay, which is what I'm doing there. All right, now why did I do that? Well, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce another new vertex here. I'm going to call that S. It lives off to the left. And another one called T over here that lives off to the right. And I'm going to connect S to edges. Uh, I'm going to connect S to all of the unmatched vertices. So this one and this one and that one. And I'm going to connect all of the unmatched vertices to T like that. And the reason this construction is helpful is because now what I can say is that um, the problem of finding an augmenting path in that original network with respect to that matching is identical to the problem of finding a path that goes from S to T. You can look at this construction here and you can see that indeed any path that goes from S to T has to alternate uh, between edges in precisely the way we want. Okay, so for example, let's let's start here at S, and we'll go from S, and we'll go we'll go along this edge here like this, and then we'll go um, along. We could just go straight to the right, but I don't want to do that. We'll go here, and then we'll go um, we'll go here like this over to the left, and now we'll go uh, down one more time like this and then we'll move over here to the left and then we'll move down here and i'm getting some lag on my tablet here but i hope the the picture is clear enough and now i'll move over to t and then i uh i will have arrived so forgive the lag there just there it is okay and there we show up so you can see that any path from s to t has to alternate between edges in the matching so if you believe me that there are algorithms out there for finding a path between two nodes in a network, if you accept that that's a thing, then uh, you should believe me that it's possible to find an alternating path in a network. Okay, we'll, we'll get a lot in, into more of this kind of stuff later on in the course, but I just wanted to give some sense into how you would make an algorithm out of this. Okay, so that's, um, that's perfect matching and that's uh, maximum matching and, and things like that. Um, I'm sure it's not surprising to you that uh, something that is also very valuable to us is not just the question of how much of this stuff of the, you know how much of how big of a matching can you get or you know is there a perfect matching um, something that is is probably more useful is um, to look at the um, what happens when you put valuations on these edges so you have the values attached to them. So let's ask a question where you have um, you have a bipartite network and you have weights on these edges. And uh, let's say it's a complete bipartite network, as is the case here, although it doesn't have to be. Uh, so we'll say everything on the left is connected to everything on the right. And uh, we'll say that you want to find a perfect matching um, 
and you want to find a perfect matching that maximizes, let's say, the sum of the edges that you select. And I wrote down here, I said, instead of a perfect matching, you want a matching that maximizes the total valuation. Um, perhaps I shouldn't have used the word instead. Um, we're, we're going to, for the time being, just concentrate on uh, perfect matchings whose value is as large as possible. So this would be a perfect matching whose value is uh, 12 plus 6, that's 18, plus 5 is 23. And this turns out to be the, the best perfect matching you could, you could get. Okay, so this is like, you know, pairing, um, pairing things up to, to maximize the total happiness or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's write this as an integer program. It's, it's really uh, clean and easy. Uh, you'd have a, if n is the number of, um, if n is the number of vertices in either piece, then you'd, you'd have a decision matrix, a binary matrix of zeros and ones, xij. And, uh, you know, xij is one if, uh, vertex i in the left is assigned to vertex j in the right. And then, uh, cij is these coefficients here. That's these, these numbers here. So, so C11 would be 12 because that's the, the, first, uh, the first vertex on the left and the first on the right. And then uh, I don't know what else here. So uh, C2, uh, 3 comma 2, C32 would be 6 because this is the third vertex in the left and then the, the second on the right. I think that's probably pretty clear. And then the constraints are, are really nice, right? You'd say, well, for every J... Uh, for every column J of, the, of this matrix, uh, the sum of the entries there, the sum of the I's has to be one. And then uh, for every row of this matrix, the sum of the, the J's has to be one, right? So it's just, you, you need a matrix where uh, there's a one in every row and, and a one in every column, right? So something like a one, one, and a one. Uh, right, that would be, and I'll, I'll put zeros everywhere else just so you, so you know what the heck I'm talking about. Zero, zero, like that. All right, this would be, this would correspond to a matching where, let's see, so one would be paired up with two, and then uh, one on the left would be paired with two on the right. Uh, two on the left would be paired with one on the right, and then um, three would be paired with uh, three on the right. So, okay, we'll, we'll draw this uh, bipartite network here. It would just be, um, you know, one goes to two, two goes to one, and three goes to three, like that. Okay, so that's how we represent that. The, um, and of course, you could relax this to a linear program, right? You could relax, the, relax this and say, uh, um, you could do this, right? You could just say, uh, take the binary constraint and, and get rid of that and say, okay, do this, uh, do the same thing, but now just do a linear relaxation. Um, if you've taken a course in optimization before, you've, you've probably done this a lot. Well, if you've taken a course in discrete optimization, you've, you've surely done this. And um, it's natural to ask, well, so what do we know has to be true here? Um, we know that when we go from the binary problem, the integer program, to the continuous problem, to the linear one, we are relaxing a constraint, right? We are, we are removing the binary constraint. And so we're relaxing the problem, which means the objective value could only get better, which is exactly um, what we expect to happen. What is interesting, though, is that this polytope here, this set of constraints, oh, I got to have the non-negativity too, this family of constraints has the interesting property that the objective values of these two problems are actually the same. So when I take this integer program and I relax it to a linear program, it turns out that the optimal objective values do not change. And they do not change um, because uh, there exists, um, because it turns out that the corners, forgive me, sorry, the corners of this LP, let me scratch that out there, it turns out that the corners of this LP exactly correspond to the feasible points of, uh, of this integer program here. Uh, that is what's called the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. Um, and it is stated as follows. It says a doubly stochastic matrix is a convex combination of permutation matrices. Now, what do those mean? Uh, the feasible points for the linear program are called doubly stochastic matrices. So a doubly stochastic matrix is a matrix of non-negative elements whose rows and columns sum to one. If you've taken a course on Markov chains, you've seen stochastic matrices all the time, right? And then doubly stochastic says something about reversibility, which, uh, which I don't remember 
uh, despite the fact that I just taught that course. Uh, so the feasible points for the LP are called doubly stochastic matrices. That's just, you know, any, as I said, any non-negative matrix whose rows and columns sum to uh, one. And then the feasible uh, points for, for this integer program are called permutation matrices. So a permutation matrix, if you've taken linear algebra before, you've probably seen that. It's just a, it's a matrix with a bunch of zeros and ones that I had just erased a moment ago where you have a one in, in each row and, uh, and in each column. And so this theorem tells you, uh, it tells you, it, this theorem here suffices to prove that there's no integrality gap, uh, or there's no, there's no difference really between uh, the objective value of the linear program and the integer program. Because it, what it's saying is that any feasible point to this LP here, any feasible point to this thing can be written as a convex um, as a convex sum of, or a, a convex combination of uh, permutation matrices, and, and therefore um, the corners of this feasible region are exactly the points that are of interest up here in this IP. Okay, so um, that's what we're going to prove. We're going to say, give me any doubly stochastic matrix, and I'll express it as a convex combination of permutation matrices. And so the proof is actually a proof by, by algorithm, which is kind of neat. It's, it's constructive and it's very, very clean. Uh, and it goes like this. So let's fire up MATLAB here and, and we'll run through the steps of this proof. And, uh, and you can follow them along in the slides as well. So X will be a doubly stochastic matrix and we will do the following. So first things first, let's uh, generate X and you'll see it here. There you go. Okay, so X is, is there. It's 5 by 5, and um, uh, it's 5 by 5, and you've got, um, you can ignore this stuff down here for a moment. It's 5 by 5. You've got the, the rows. If you were to check, you'd see that, indeed, they, they sum to 1, uh, as do the columns. And uh, so you have that. You, and now next, you build a bipartite network. Uh, this is a 5 by 5 matrix, so you would build a bipartite network with, with 5 nodes on the left and 5 nodes on the right. And you'd have an edge between any two nodes if you have a non-zero entry in the matrix. So, for example, here you've got a non-zero entry there in the third row in the fourth column, and so that that means you'd have uh, you know the third uh, node on the left would be connected to the fourth node on the right. Uh, okay. Now, step two says uh, find a perfect matching, and we haven't established that this exists. It says find a perfect matching of this network and uh, define a permutation matrix in a certain way. So we've done this um, over here. We've got, uh, we took this matrix and we took a perfect matching. And now remember, um, as we described before, a perfect matching means um, a, a collection of entries uh, with one entry in each row and one entry in each column. So uh, we've done that here. We, we happen to find one, um, which I'm calling uh, M. Uh, although I called it pi in the slides, and so that's obtained by taking this entry there, and this entry here, and then this entry down there, and then uh, this one here, and then this one there. Okay, so I, I looked at the non-zero entries, and I selected one non-zero entry in each row and each column. Now, I will need to prove to you that you can always do that. Okay, I've, I've done it here, and, and we'll, we'll look at that at the very tail end of the proof, and then you do that. Uh, and then you say, okay, of about, uh, let's take this perfect matching and lo let's look at the smallest number that appeared. And for, for uh, reasons that are kind of silly, they're, the smallest number actually happens to appear twice. It's 0.1725. And so what you do next is you say, okay, update this matrix by taking that smallest entry here. Again, I, I called it little m here, but I call it a q uh, here in the slides. Um, take that smallest entry and subtract it from all of these numbers here. So we're going to take uh, 0.1725, and we're going to subtract it from this entry, and we'll subtract it from, from this entry, and from this entry, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what do we get once we do that? We get a new doubly, um, a matrix that is not doubly stochastic anymore because you've subtracted this number from it. Um, but you've subtracted it once from each row and once from each column, and so the rows and columns still sum to the same value, although it's less than one now. 
and you, uh, you repeat that process. So we go through that again. So what do I have now? Now I have this new matrix X down here, and now the entries sum to, the, the, the rows and the columns sum to, as I just said, something uh, less than one, but it's the same value. And so you take this matrix, and again, you, you, build, this, you build this bipartite network with, um, there we go, uh, a bipartite network uh, with the non-zero entries, and look for a perfect matching. So we, we did that down here. Uh, the perfect matching is uh, it's you extract this entry and then uh, this entry here and, and so on and so forth. Um, sorry, 30, 3203 is up there, 4185 is, is down there, and so on and so forth. And you say, okay, out of these non-zero entries I've identified, pick the smallest one, that's this one, 0.2215, and subtract 0.2215 from uh, these entries here in the original matrix X, and you do that. Now, what am I accomplishing when I do this? What is, why am I doing this? You'll notice, as I iterate on this process, I'm finding more and more zeros in these matrices. So here's the one I started with, right? And then what did I do? I subtracted 0.1725 from, uh, once from each row and once from each column and, and by looking at these particular entries. Okay, when I did that, um, what does that mean? I, I, 0.1725 was the smallest entry that I had in that matching. And so in particular, it means that 0.1725 vanished from my, from my matrix. And so when I updated, you can see that before I had a, a 0.1725 in the, the second uh, 2 comma 1 space and the 5 comma 5 uh, space, but now those have gotten zeroed out because I subtracted this number. Okay, and so what I'm constantly doing is I'm subtracting these smallest values uh, from, from the matrix, and in doing so, I'm resulting in, in more and more uh, values being equal to zero. And I claim that if I just keep doing this, uh, what eventually is going to happen, well, it's not even so much a claim, it's, it's sort of manifestly obvious that if I, if I repeat this process, I'm going to get more and more zeros appearing in my matrix because... Um, each time I do this step, there's at least one entry that's getting zeroed out. And so eventually I'll, I'll just keep doing this until I, I wind up with nothing but zeros. And uh, you'll see this happen soon. So now, I, now I've subtracted things down to this and now this, and I suspect this will be, be the final blow that kind of zeroes everything out. Or, okay, maybe one more. Um, I'm down here now. I've got 0.245 for everything. And... And now I'll zero it out, and MATLAB's probably going to give me a bunch of NANs. Oh, no, okay, it's good. All right, we're done. Um, okay, so why does that prove anything? <laughs> what have I accomplished there? Um, so first of all, I, 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 indeed, I, this all hinges on me uh, being able to find a perfect matching, which, which I haven't explained the existence of. But, but before I do that, I just want to say, okay, why, why was there any significance to this at all? Well, the thing that I accomplished in doing this is... Uh, remember what I did is I took my matrix and then I took the you know smallest entry in these matchings and then subtracted that from the the matching that I obtained and uh, I subtracted these things off until I got zero and what that tells you is if I were to add them all up again I would recover my original matrix and so what I did by subtracting these terms away is I actually uh, found a um, I found an expression for X as a convex combination of these permutation matrices. And the, the coefficients of the permutation matrices are exactly those uh, smallest terms that I was isolating when I was running MATLAB back there. Um, and so that tells me that if, if you believe that that algorithm I just did is always viable, which is to say, if you believe that I can always find this uh, perfect matching, if you accept that, then I've proven my desired theorem, which uh, the goal was to say that any doubly stochastic matrix is a convex combination of permutation matrices. That was the goal. Um, I do need to still justify this assertion that you can always find a uh, perfect matching. And so the way you do that is actually uh, through Hall's matching, uh, Hall's marriage theorem, or Hall's uh, matching theorem, sorry. Um, and, uh, and it looks like this. So you pick any set of rows, okay, pick any set of rows of this matrix. So X is our doubly stochastic matrix that we're starting with. Pick some set of rows, 
And so what is N of S? N of S is the set of all the non-zero columns in those rows by construction. So what is true? The cardinality of S, the number of rows that I've selected, is equal to what? That's the same as if I were to take every, every row belonging to S and just sum, sum that up, right? Because the rows have to sum to 1 because you have a doubly stochastic matrix. So the size of S is equal to just the sum over all I in S of um, all the entries in the rows. Uh, now, in particular, then, we, that's the same as summing just over the non-zero entries because adding zeros does nothing. So that's the same as if I were to say the sum over all I in S uh, and the sum over all j in n of s of x i j, that's the same thing. And now you'd say, well, s and n of s, uh, you could flip these two, right? Instead of summing over i and then over all j, I could sum over all j and then over all i because they're just, um, you know, the j's don't, uh, don't depend on the i's uh, and, and the i's don't depend on the j's. And so you can do that. You can flip those indices. And then I could say, well, the sum over all j in n of s of all i in s, um, this is less than or equal to what I get if I replace this sum with just the sum over all i's. Uh, and since this is the least stochastic matrix, that would have to be equal to 1. And then I'd be getting 1s for every column in n of s, which is therefore the cardinality of n of s. So I've established that any row of uh, any set of rows s the cardinality that is less than or equal to the cardinality of n of s, and that is how that proof works. A natural application of bipartite networks, which I uh, referred to briefly a moment ago, is in what is called mechanism design or market design. Um, that would be a scenario where the um, two sets of vertices in a bipartite network correspond to people that want to buy things and then the other piece would be uh, people that are selling things and so you're, you're matching up a supply with demand um, in this bipartite network so we'll look at a really simple stylized model although it's, it's one that uh, generalizes in, in all the ways that you would want it to We'll say that we have n buyers and n goods. So in this case, uh, in this picture, you see here n is equal to 3. Um, and these buyers are going to a market, and each of them is going to buy um, a single good. Okay, you can think that these are, you know, different healthcare plans or something. They're, they're going to buy one of these. And uh, we're going to say that we'll have weights on these edges. Um, and these weights correspond to um, how much the buyer values that particular item. Okay, so we'll look at some examples of this here. There's, there's an 8 there. You'll notice that some of these edges are grayed out. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, there's an 8 there. That means that this second uh, buyer has a value of 8 associated with the first item here. Uh, that, that first buyer is labeled a B and then that first um, item is labeled with an X. Okay, so, so if you look at this buyer here, their valuations for the three items are uh, eight and then seven and six respectively, which means that this first item here is, is uh, that second buyer's favorite. Let's erase this here and refer to more of this. Um, so I said that we're looking at um, people who are buying things and when you buy things, you have to talk about prices. And so what you'll see I've done here in this picture, uh, or in these three pictures, I guess, is I've put these labels, I've put these weights on the edges representing how much the buyers like the goods, and I've also put weights on the red vertices. Now the weights on the red vertices here are going to uh, represent the price of these items. All right, so, so let's look at what happens here. So what is a... What does a buyer do when they come to a market? They look at how much they like the item, okay? And then they subtract the price of that item. And that, uh, that is the, you know, um, adjusted value of that item to, uh, to that person, right? So the sellers uh, sell goods at different prices, PJ, and buyers want to maximize their valuation uh, minus the price. So they take the you take the, the value of the item and you subtract the price. And so that gets us to these um, thick and uh, thick and, and, and thin uh, edges that I've drawn here. Um, so let's look at, the, look at the way these buyers would behave in a market. 
under uh, these various prices here. It's actually the only things that change in these three pictures are the, uh, the prices. The evaluations all stay the same. Um, so let's look through this here and let's, let's, let's observe the different phenomena that, that are um, you know, relevant. So we'll look at buyer A, the first buyer. The first buyer would say, um, how value is this item to me? Uh, well, it has a value of 12 and then minus 2, so that's 10. Okay, so the, the overall impact, if, if buyer 1 were to end up with the first item, would be 10. That's 12 minus 2. Uh, the second item would be 12 minus, sorry, 2 minus 1. And then that third item would be 4 minus 0. And so out of those three uh, choices, uh, certainly the first item with a value of 10 was the best. And so under this, uh, under these, under this, the prices I've written down here, two and one and zero, uh, buyer one would say, I'm, I'm going for, I'm going for that first item for sure, uh, without a doubt. Uh, the second buyer here, the second buyer has values of eight and seven and six for these items. And the prices are two and one and zero. And so actually the second buyer becomes indifferent at this point because the, the adjusted value to the second buyer is always going to be 6. It's either 8 minus 2, or it's 7 minus 1, or it's 6 minus 0. So in any of those cases, uh, the second buyer ends up with the same, um, the same valuation, so, so they don't really care. Um, you, uh, you'll see that the third buyer um, ends up liking the first item uh, as their favorite as well. The net value, or the adjusted value there is 7 minus 2. Um, as opposed to 5 minus 1 or 2 minus 0 for the others. So this first market, or the first um, set of prices, I guess, um, you would say that is it is inefficient. Um, it is not desirable because you have a, um, you have a conflict here. You can see that um, although the second buyer is completely indifferent, is, is perfectly uh, sort of neutral, uh, both the first and the third buyers want this first item here. And we'll assume there's only one of each item, and so one of those buyers is going to be unhappy. There's, there's an excess of demand for this first item here. Okay, so we'd look at this, uh, we'd look at these prices and say, well, these, these prices are not, um, they do not uh, clear the market is the term that you use there. You'd say they don't clear the market because um, uh, there's, there's uh, two buyers that both want the first item there. Now, if you change these prices, so let's think about what, is, what does economics say you should do in this situation? Well, that first item is, has an excess of demand, and so that first item should raise its price. It'll bring that 2 to a 5. And then why did I bring that 1 to a 2 over here? I'm not sure. I think I just felt like it. Um, but under this situation, you'll see that actually the market does clear because the first buyer ends up uh, still retaining that preference for the first item, but now the third buyer says um, that five, uh, that price of five is too great for me, so actually I prefer the second item, and then the second buyer prefers the third item. So this is a perfect matching now, and we're happy about that. Those prices are, we'd say they're efficient, so they're market clearing. Um, and then this third example here also has the market being cleared, although you have indifferences with um, buyers two and three, and that, that isn't actually very relevant to this problem. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, you would still say this third, um, this third example here does constitute a market clearing because you would put the first buyer with the first item, and that leaves the third buyer has to be paired to the second item, and then the a second buyer has to be paired with the third, just like in the um, market that, that preceded it. So we're going to ask the, the question. We're going to say, um, is it true, um, is it the case that you can always price things so that the market clears? Okay, that's, that's what we, we'd like for that to be true, right? That would be really nice because um, in some sense you can, you can put faith in the pricing system then that, that if you have any, no matter what the values are, no matter what the values are that the buyers have for these items in here, um, we want to know, is it possible for me to come up with prices here uh, in such a way that when each buyer selects their favorite item with respect to this sort of adjusted um, valuation, um, that they get their favorite item and that you, 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 you pair things up in a one-to-one -one correspondence. 
Um, so in other words, the question is, you know, can you always make can you always make this situation uh, happen as opposed to say this one over here? So we're going to try to answer that question and see can you do this or could we construct a counterexample where this is not possible? So we'll get back to this. Um, now, how did I even start talking about this? Well, we were talking about linear programming formulations of bipartite matching. Um, and so here's that formulation again, all right? You have, uh, you want to maximize the weight of this matching and the rows and columns have to sum to one. And this is a linear program, so we're going to just use non-negativity. And we already established that this LP has a solution, uh, a corner solution that has nothing of zeros and ones in it. So we'll, we'll, we're looking at this LP relaxation without loss of generality. And just for fun, if you've taken a course on linear programming, you know, you know what's, what's the most fun thing to do with the linear program other than solve it? We'll take the dual. Um, just for fun, let's take the dual and, and try and construct a story around it and see if that tells us anything. Um, so what can we say about this? Well, we have, um, we have n squared variables in the primal and, uh, and then two n constraints here. And so the dual problem has two n variables and we'll call those uh, lambda, uh, I think this is nu is this one and, and lambda is this one over here, not that it matters. Uh, and nu for, for the one and lambda for the other. And the dual problem looks like this. You have a maximized problem in the primal, so you have a minimized problem in the dual. Um, you have equality constraints in the primal, which means that both of your variables are allowed to go negative if you want them to. Um, and you have um, non-negative variables in the primal, which means your inequalities go this direction. Um, this is probably not new to you. So the dual problem looks like this. You want to choose nu and lambda, which are both vectors in Rn, to minimize the sum of the nu's plus the sum of the lambdas, um, because we had all ones over there like that, so that's our objective function. Uh, minimize the sum of the nu's plus the sum of the lambdas, and then for every ij you have a constraint that nu i plus lambda j has to be greater than or equal to cij. All right, so let's let's look at this dual problem a little bit. Let's uh, let's try and, and understand its structure and see if it tells us anything about our uh, original problem. Now, remember, I was talking about pricing and mechanism design just a minute ago, and I've completely digressed from that, and I'm now talking about linear programming duality. Um, there's a reason I did that. There is a connection here, so I haven't just skewed off on a completely uh, irrelevant tangent. Let's keep looking at that dual problem. Um, first of all, this dual problem, you could look at this and you could conclude um, in a pretty straightforward way that there's actually infinitely many solutions to this thing. There are infinitely many solutions because if I were to add a constant, and it's very unfortunate that I use the letter C here because C is also my um, values here, so that, that C just represents any arbitrary constant. Um, if I take a feasible solution to this problem and I add a constant to nu, and then I subtract that same constant from lambda, um, you can verify that it's not going to change anything about this problem because you only ever see nu's and lambdas in, in pairs in this, in this whole formulation here. So if I have an optimal solution, I can get another optimal solution by adding 17 to the nu's and subtracting 17 from the lambdas and nothing would change. So let's, let's try and force our solution to be unique, or at least try and restrict ourselves a bit to, um, to simplify this dual. And just for fun, let's say, okay, let's, let's uh, impose a constraint that these lambdas have to sum to zero. Okay, I could require them to sum to 17 if I like. I could, I could do whatever I want. I'm gonna require them to sum to zero because that lets me uh, drop this term from the objective function. And so I could do that, and now we'll say, okay, that dual problem that I wrote out is the same as this one down here. You still have nu and lambda, uh, but now you're minimizing just the sum of the nu's, and then you're, uh, you have the same constraint as before, and then we've, we've just artificially added in this condition that the lambdas have to sum to zero um, for just because I felt like doing that. Um, and so let's make a couple of observations here. The first observation is that complementary slackness says the following. Okay, and we'll come back to this. It says that at the optimal solution, 
what has to be true. At the optimal solution, um, you know, one of these two terms has to be, these are two terms that are multiplied by one another, right? A thing from the dual and a, and a thing from the primal. Um, so let's imagine I have the optimal matching. Okay, that's the optimal uh, value of these xij stars. And in particular, uh, what does that mean? It means uh, some of those xij stars are equal to 1, right? Most of them are equal to 0, but the, the edges that are matched, those are equal to 1. And if you have xij star equal to 1, that means that this thing is going to have to be 0. Um, and we'll look at what that implies about this problem in just a minute. Um, let's also say that this new dual problem that I have here, okay, the one that I just worked out a minute ago, um, if I like, I could take this lambda j and I could move it over there, right? So this would be cij minus lambda j, and that would go over here, okay? And so what would I be left with now? I'd be saying minimize the sum of these nu's subject to each nu i is greater than or equal to cij minus lambda j for all j. And so that tells me that actually I can, I can get rid of these nu's altogether um, because those nu's are just ending up being, um, I guess you could call them slack variables or, or auxiliary variables or, or whatever you like. Um, those nu's just end up being sort of uh, extra variables that you would use if you were trying to linearize this problem down here, which only depends on lambda. Okay, so this problem says minimize, choose lambda to minimize the sum of this thing, the sum over all i of the max of the j of the cij's minus the lambda j's uh, subject to uh, the constraint that these lambdas sum to zero. So I've made a very compact uh, expression now for that dual. It, it only depends on, on lambda. All right, now what, what was the purpose of doing all this? Um, there is a point to this. Um, as I said before, complementary slackness dictates uh, that this has to be true. Okay, it has to. It, if I if I look at what complementary, I, I wrote a minute ago what complementary slackness says about the, the linear program with the nu's and the lambdas, and so now I've just written that same expression there, but now I've gotten rid of the the nu's in this piecewise linear thing, and so now I, I can conclude that the complementary slackness conditions from linear programming tell me that. Um, if xij star is equal to 1 in the optimal matching, then this thing here has to be 0. Okay, and what does that mean? Uh, it means, okay, I wrote it out here, this thing here it has to be 0, and we're just going to move this thing over to that side of the inequality, or of the equation, rather. And now I end up with this. I end up with, uh, if xij star is equal to 1, so if i is paired up with j in the optimal matching, then this has to be true here. Okay, ci minus lambda j star is equal to the maximum overall k of ci k minus lambda k star. Okay, so the, the j has to be the, the maximal, um, the j has to be the index where ci k minus lambda k star is, is maximized over all of these. Now, where have you seen this expression before? The maximum, let me erase all this so I can just emphasize that thing. Where have you seen me take the maximum overall k of cik minus something? Who was doing that in our previous discussion? Well, if you go back a little bit, when we were first talking about this concept of pricing, and now let's erase all this stuff, um, Remember that what is a what is a if you're um, if you're in this market if you're a buyer in this market uh, and these goods have prices attached to them okay thinking back to this example here with the, the prices and uh, you know there was no duality invoked anywhere here uh, we said if you're a buyer in this market you would take C I J so if you are buyer I and you're looking at item J uh, then you would look at um, then you would say, well, what is the value of j to be? Well, it's cij minus the price of that thing, minus pj. Um, and what does the buyer do? The buyer chooses the index j for which this thing is maximum, right? You choose the item where this quantity is as large as possible. That means you're getting the most value. 
Well, so what have I got here? I, what I have here is, is exactly that same expression. I'm saying, look at the max over all k, look at the maximum over all goods of the value of that good to me, by or i, minus, and now in this case, lambda k star, as opposed to uh, pk, right, which was a price before. Now I've got these lambdas here. But what this actually tells me is that this dual, uh, this dual variable here at optimality is a market clearing price vector. Okay, I'll, I'll, and, and I was able to conclude this by virtue of complementary slackness. So let me summarize this again. Let's suppose I take an instance of this problem, um, uh, the bipartite matching problem, and I solve the dual, and I, I solve this linearization of the dual, in fact. And I do that, and I get this vector lambda star. Okay, I, I've solved this problem, and I've just got this vector here in front of me. Um, I claim that complementary slackness says that if I were to take lambda star and take those components and set those as prices in my original problem here, so 2 and 1 and 0 like that, set the prices of these things to be equal to, to the values of the lambdas, that complementary slackness guarantees that my market will clear. Okay, my market will clear because complementary slackness says that each one of these, um, that each buyer um, is going to select the item that corresponds exactly to the non-zero entry of XIJ star, which is namely the uh, item that that uh, buyer is paired up with. Um, and actually, it, this says something a little stronger, which is that any market clearing price vector has to induce an optimal assignment uh, X star by complementary slackness. So in other words, um, any time I come up with a, a market clearing price vector, you know, maybe there's a bunch of them. Um, if I come, come up with any of them, um, what I'm now guaranteed is that the, the manner in which the buyers and sellers get paired up with one another uh, has to also be the maximum weight perfect matching. And indeed, you could look at this and say, oh yeah, that, that is true, right? The, the maximum weight matching here, um, the, the way the buyers get paired up with the items here is in fact a, exactly equal to the maximum weight perfect matching. So we have established that yes, um, there does always exist a price vector, a market clearing price vector. Not only that, um, you can find it by solving the dual of the linear program associated with bipartite matching. And furthermore, any market clearing price vector has this nice property that the way that people get paired up with things is actually a, a minimum weight or a maximum, uh, a maximum weight perfect bipartite matching. So it's, it's what you would get if you were to assign them optimally anyway. Now, so you could, you could use this kind of, um, you could use this kind of analysis if you wanted to talk about uh, sort of economics or, or philosophy, if, if you wanted to. Um, on the one hand, you could say uh, you could say this argument is uh, this is a, a capitalism argument, a pro-capitalist argument. You could say, look, uh, we said that any time you clear a market, um, you get an assignment that is is optimal, right? You, the the assignment that you end up getting is identical to to what you would get if you had a um, a, a perfect matching uh, that was you know, centrally organized, the, the, the minimum weight, the maximum weight perfect matching. Excuse me. So you could say um, this is this is a good argument. It says pricing, uh, letting pricing systems do what they need to do and clear the market actually um, gets you an optimal matching um, among everything you could you could have. So that's a good thing on the one hand, right? Look, prices get you good allocations. Um, if you wanted to counter that, you could say, well, yeah, that's true, but look at what the dual problem is actually asking you to do here. Um, it's saying you're choosing a price vector, if we want to think of things that way. It's saying choose lambda to minimize the sum of this thing here. Okay, now what is this thing here? You are summing over all i, so that's summing over all buyer. You take all bu every buyer and you look at the max over all j of this thing. So what is that? This is each buyer looking at um, looking at uh, the the um, item that is whose adjusted value is as good for them as possible. So each one of these entries here for each i, this is how much value the ith buyer ends up getting 
out of buying their favorite um, their favorite good, right? It's the maximum over these things, so it's the one that provides the most value to them. So this here, this is the sum of all of the um, adjusted value of the buyers. This is this is for each one of these. Uh, this is just the sum. Take each buyer and take how much, how happy they are in the end. It's you know the value to them minus the price. You'd say okay, and and now the dual problem has me minimize that. So this is kind of like saying choose prices to to make people as unhappy as possible because you're you're minimizing here. So you're choosing prices to make their total adjusted value as bad as possible. So if you wanted to argue against this, you could you could adopt that perspective. Now I'm I'm completely hand waving here. It's to be clear, this is not a formal argument by any means. It's just something to think about, something for you know a water cooler, coffee chit chat, or what have you. Um, and then you could counter that and say, well, that's part of that is because you inserted this completely artificial constraint that the price is sum to zero, and what the heck does that mean? That has no um, counterpart in the real world. And you could go on and on about this, and, and there, there's a lot that one could say, but uh, I, I think that's um, that's an important aspect of bipartite matching that uh, I think is um, very interesting.